Amen. Let's go to Judges chapter 7. We're going to start reading in verse 16. Amen. You all ready? This is the story, story of Gideon, by the way. We'll get into a little more context before we get started. But it says, And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall you do. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow it all. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place, round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpets. And the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shekah and Zerarath, and to the border of Abel Mahola unto Tabak. Father, we thank you for your word, O oh Lord God, and pray that you'd be with us this morning, Lord. Pray that you'd help me, that you'd use me as a vessel, a mouthpiece that you would speak your truth through. Lord, we pray for the young people this morning as they get the word of the Lord, that you would minister to them, and that you would give them strength, Lord God, and encouragement, that they would have a desire, Lord, to serve you and to live for you. Lord, do a work in their hearts, Lord. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. But, you know, we talk a lot about context in the Bible that, you know, you have to understand some of the surrounding things that are going on to be able to get a clear picture of what's happening. So there's multiple layers of context in this story. Let me just give you maybe a larger layer of context. The book of Judges. The book of Judges is coming off of the time when Joshua, the great leader, a godly leader, had led the children of Israel into the promised land. God had told them that he had a land for them. And it was the land previously known as Canaan. It was a land of promise. And God said that there would be great blessing in the land of Canaan. And Joshua was a leader. If you remember the story of Joshua, he believed God in his word. He believed that God was, was powerful enough to give them victory over their enemy. Amen. And, and they, they went into the land with great victory. But then Joshua died. And Israel was left without leadership. This is the time frame. It was about 400 years, the time frame of the judges, after they entered the land and before the kings. And so the judges ruled the land. And the Bible says in a multiple times that there was no king in the land in those days and that each man did what was right in his own eyes. Now, you got to know that whenever there's, we live in the midst of a time frame and man, it doesn't matter whether he loves the Lord or whether he doesn't even know the Lord. If a man is being led by what is right in his own eyes and in his own heart, the Bible says that the heart of man is, is deceitfully wicked and who can know it? So whether we want to see that about ourselves or not, I'm telling you, I can remember a song a long time ago, I was doing a teaching on music, and, and the name of the song was the, the Compass, and it had to do with letting your heart tell you where to go. In other words, just, just listen to your heart. Your heart will lead you in the right direction. No, my friend, that's not true. Your heart will lead you in the wrong direction. And, you know, that has something to do with my message this morning, but let us hold off till we get there. Your heart will bring you down a path that will ultimately lead to destruction. That is what I have learned in the journey of life. However, the Word of God will lead us in truth. The Spirit of God will lead us in truth. And many times where God is leading us, it's, com it's opposite of what of what we want. So in the time frame of the judges, each man did what was right in his own eyes. So there was great trouble in the land. There was chaos and confusion. And there was lack of peace, if you will. And, and God would rise up a, a judge each time 
to deliver the people because, see, whenever God's people that know the Lord and love God, once, once you and I come to a place where we've given our heart to God and we've tasted and we've seen that the Lord is good, then and we venture outside of that, then it becomes painful whenever we venture outside of that and we begin to feel that chaos. And, and many times when we feel the darkness that surrounds our life, we'll call out to the Lord. Amen. We'll say, Lord, won't you rescue me? Or Lord, won't you move and minister in the midst of the situation? Listen, don't get complacent in your life and in your walk with God that you start to think that it's normal Christianity for us to just live uh, in, in despair and in heartache. That's not normal Christianity. Jesus died on the cross to give us his spirit so that you and I can have joy in our hearts. So you and I can have peace in our life. But in the time frame of the judges, they would go through these times where there was great heartache and frustration. And then they would finally call out on the Lord. And he was faithful like he always is. He would show up and he would minister to them and he would give them victory. The story of Judges 6 and 7, the life of Gideon is no different. Specifically, in this time, the Bible says in the beginning of chapter 6, it says that Israel did what was wicked in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible says that they had gone on after false gods, and God allowed their enemies, specifically this enemy was known as the Midianites. God allowed their enemy each and every harvest time, like clockwork, the Midianites would come. They were a huge nation. They had camels. As far as the eye could see when they would show up. And they would wait specifically for Israel to begin their harvest. Now, can you imagine that? I mean, you got if, if you're not a farmer, if you don't work a garden, I don't. But I try to imagine the story. Can you imagine that you plow the field? Can you imagine that you plant the seed? Now, we're not talking about when you got John Deere tractor, my friend. We're talking about you got a donkey, you got some ox, and you got a plow, and you're over there doing the manual labor. You plant the seed, and then, then the crop comes in, and it's finally time to harvest, and then all of a sudden, your enemy comes in, and he just ravishes the land. The Bible says that there's so many camels, and if you think about it, he, the camels would graze on the grass and just eat up everything, and then the Midianites would take the harvest to where there was nothing left for the people of God. Now, i got to tell you that I've learned something in my walk in the New Testament of Christian life. Before I gave my heart to the Lord, or even at times when I wasn't really giving my heart completely to the Lord, I would tell you that it almost seemed as though I had holes in my pocket. No matter what I did, no matter how hard I tried, there was never there was more month than there was money. Listen, sometimes God allows those things to take place in our life because he's trying to get our attention. He's trying to get us to pay better attention to how we're handling the money that he allows us to have. Sometimes it's a trial to draw us closer to him spiritually. Amen. But I'm just here to tell you that that kind of thing that was happening then can still happen today. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what John said in his gospel. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and that's what Jesus said in John's gospel. He said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that you would have it more abundantly. The children of Israel were being stolen from. As a matter of fact, God found Gideon, and he, the Bible's the idea in the, in the original language is that he's threshing wheat inside of a wine press. I don't have time to really break that down a lot, but let me just tell you, you're not supposed to thresh wheat inside of a wine press. Real quick, let me give you a picture. Uh, you're supposed to thresh wheat on a big old flat space where the wind can catch the husk. Uh, yeah, yeah, you've eaten peanuts before. You kind of roll them in your hand and you get that little skin off the peanut right there before you eat it. Well, guess what? Grain has a husk like that. And so what they would do is they'd crush the grain and they'd get a pitchfork. They'd throw piles of the grain up in the air and the wind would catch the chaff and blow it away. And the grain heavier would fall back to the ground. He's inside of a wine press. You're supposed to stomp grapes in a wine press. Why is he in a wine press? Because he's hiding from the Midianites. He's trying to hold on to the little bit that he has left. Because he's fearful that they're going to steal from him what belongs to him after all of his hard work. God ends up calling him and it's a great story. But in this particular spot where we are, see God wants to give victory to his people. And in this particular story where we are, the immediate context that I want you to see is that God has whittled down an army from 22,000 people to just 300. 
And those 300 have been separated into three separate groups. And the Midianites are down in a valley, and the Israelites are up on a hill, and it's nighttime, and the Midianites' camp is down there, all their tents and their little lights, and they're just over there like loving life. Oh, man, this Israeli grain is so good. Don't we just love it, man? We're just so blessed. But the Lord has a plan to give them victory. And in this particular story, somehow, I don't know exactly how they did it, but they had some type of a clay pitcher, some type of a vessel made out of clay, earthenware, comes from the earth. I want you to get that in your head this morning. Probably had a back window on it, I'm guessing, in order for, for oxygen to be able to get for the flame to stay lit, right? And so they had their torches on the inside, or their lamps, if you will, on the inside of this pitcher, and then they had a trumpet that they blew, and they blew the horn, which was always a sign that there would, the, the blow of the trumpet was to gather the people. See, whenever the Lord blows his trumpet, he's going to gather his people. That's another story. For another time, or it was a time to come to war. And so they blew the trumpet, they broke the pitcher or the vessel, and it allowed the light to shine. And then the Bible says that the Lord turned the enemy's sword upon his fellow. That means they started killing themselves. So in the midst of that story, that's what I wanted to tell you. This is my title of my message, Let His Light Blind Your Enemy. Now, what I do want you to know is, is that I, 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 I don't want there to be any confusion. I'm kind of like using this as an, I guess you would say, an abstract thought in some sense. These three particular passages remind me of this passage that we just spoke of. Because in each case, and we're going to look at them real briefly... In each case, there has something to do with the earth. So in this case, the pictures were made of clay. Clay comes from the earth. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it has to do with the, the dust of the earth that God formed Adam, Adam from. In John chapter 2, verse 6, it's the first miracle that Jesus performed. And it had to do with those pots of stone. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, it talks about the fact that... That we have this treasure in earthen vessels, which again, that's probably where that band, that Christian band, Clars, uh, Jars of Clay, gets their name from, from, this, from that particular scripture of earthen vessels, all right? So what I want you to see is the first man of the earth. 1 Corinthians 15, 47 talks about that. Well, we're going to look at that scripture a little bit more closely, but it says that the first man, Adam, comes from the earth. Now, what I got to tell you is, is that because of the fact that we were taken from the earth, there is in some way some type of a remaining connection between your humanity and this earth that you were, that we were originally formed from. I want you to know that. that the earth tries to hold on to you. This world tries to hold on to you. There is that which is of the earth that is sensual, and there is that which is of the spirit. Amen. When God created Adam and formed him out of the dust of the earth, he breathed his life giving breath in Adam and made him a living soul. Amen. God wants to breathe his life giving breath on the inside of you by giving you and I his spirit. And there's a whole world out there that doesn't know. That's why I didn't understand. I was so confused. I didn't want to take over that God's Bible study. But I wanted to say, I understand what you're trying to say, sir. You're, you're saying that the new covenant isn't fulfilled yet because Israel hasn't come in. I don't have a problem with that. But how can we not be in the new covenant when the whole purpose of the new covenant is that God wants his spirit to live on the inside of his people? It's important that you know that, Chris. Yes, it's important that you know that if you're born again this morning, the spirit of God lives on the inside of you. I hope that that bears witness with your spirit. I hope that you are born again this morning and it makes sense what I'm telling you. I'm not, I didn't say you walked in this place perfect this morning. I didn't say you don't have any struggles still in your life. What I'm trying to say is, is that if you heard the gospel, what is the gospel? The good news. What is the good news? That there was some bad news. That Adam in his fall caused sin to enter the human race. But Jesus in his death gives opportunity for you and I to be born again from the dead. And when you heard that good news and you said yes in your heart to Jesus. You said, yes, I'm a sinner. I need you to come into my heart. When you said yes to the Lord, guess what happened? His spirit, just like when God breathed on the inside of Adam's lungs 
In a similar fashion, God breathed His Spirit on the inside of you on that day. And your life will never be the same, my friend. You can run, you can hide, you can, you can go hundreds of miles away from the house of God, but you'll never leave the presence of God. Amen. He, will, he will follow you. Oh, he's very gentlemanly about it, if that's not really a word, but I just made it up. He's, been, he's a gentleman about it. He's not going to overtake you, but he will, you will, he will hound you in his own way. And you will know it's him that's staying on your tail. And he's not going to give up on you. And you know, sometimes it'll feel like he wasn't there. Sometimes you'll find yourself in the midst of darkness and confusion and chaos. But he was there the whole time. Amen. I always like that little story, footprints in the sand. I don't remember exactly how the story goes. It was like, I thought you said you'd never leave me, Lord. Sometimes I see in the journey of my life, there was only one set of footprints. He said, I didn't leave you. Sometimes of the times I was carrying you. Amen. The Lord wants to carry us through this journey. Amen. So look, the first man of the earth, he was formed from the earth. And i got to tell you that there's always going to try to be a connection to this earthly realm where the enemy is going to use that. In your first birth to try to hold you down and keep you away from the Lord. But look, in John chapter 2, verse 6, we'll talk about it a little bit more. This is when the first man becomes a new man. I believe in the first miracle that Jesus performed. We'll talk about it a little bit. It's a type of what God planned to do through Jesus in the new covenant, in the New Testament. All right? And in 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7, God's glory enters into an earthen vessel. So I want you to see the progression. Man formed of the earth. Originally, he wasn't like that. When God originally formed Adam and breathed his life, he was not with sin. Instead, he wasn't marred clay, if you will. Instead, he was, he was from an earth that was not fallen yet. But then when Adam fell and all of his offspring with him, the rest of the human race had fallen into this place. And listen, but there's a, there's a new covenant there's a new opportunity to receive Christ. And whenever we do, God puts his glory back inside of this earthen vessel. Uh, particularly in Genesis 2, 7, the word of God says that God formed Adam out of the earth. You see, and I particularly uh, chose a picture that showed the clay is red and I particularly on purpose put the word earth in red. And the reason why I did that was because you may not have known this, but the name Adam actually means red. And also, you may not know this, but you remember the story of Esau and Jacob, the two twins in the Old Testament, right? Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Esau was the firstborn. See, the first man, Adam. See, Esau, his nation became known as Edom. Edom is a variant of Adam, and it means red. If you remember the story of Esau when he was born, what did it say? He was all red and hairy. As the Bible says, the man came out a baby, red and hairy. Okay, he was the first birth. If you remember the story, see the Bible's trying to tell us something. With every page that we turn, that there in that first birth that you find in Adam and Esau being the first birth, he did not regard the things of God. He was of the earth. He was sensual in his understanding. He was a hunter, and all he cared about was the physical aspects of life. The Bible says he sold his birthright, which was his connection. To the kingdom of God and Jacob. We don't have time to talk about Jacob this morning, but God brought him through a journey to break him down so he could change his name to Israel, one that will rule with God, Prince of God. See, God wants to make you and I princes because He has a plan for our lives that one day we'll rule and reign with Him. So God formed Adam from the dust of the earth. You know, I have you ever been to Mississippi up in the hills? I just drove to Mississippi. I don't mean, I didn't go too far up in there, but I got the one little spot. I looked off the side. Look at that red dirt right there. See, the earth, that, that's what the connection is right there. I wanted you to see that. See, the, the, the hands of the potter on the wheel. God making man from clay. That's, I want you to see that connection, those pictures, those vessels that that light was in on the inside there. Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This comes straight out the Hebrew of the Strongs. I want you to see the, the, the words in red. It says dust, but look, clay and earth. That's, that's what it says down there at the bottom. Clay comes from the earth. And, and I just get this picture of God the great potter forming mankind on this will the potter's will. 
Now we're transitioning over to John chapter 2, verse 6. And it says right there, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. I want you to see that word stone right there because, see, that also comes from the earth. It was an earthen vessel. It was different than clay. Clay would hold on to impurities. And so it had to be broken. It couldn't be used for ritualistic purification. But what I want you to see is this, because, see, you, and I've preached this before, but it, at some point in time in your journey of Christianity, you're going to run in to a Christian that's going to make a comment, and I know you will because I've made the comments before, and I'm pretty sure you've made the comments before, whenever we wanted to justify drinking wine, or we're around people that want to justify drinking wine, and they make the comment, and listen, all I can tell you is this, is that you're not supposed to drink anything that's going to change and alter your, the, your mental status. You're not supposed to put chemicals in your brain that's going to that's gonna alter the way you think. The Bible specifically says this, be ye not filled with wine, but be ye filled with the Spirit. But let me just tell you this, if you put enough wine in your body, it's going to diffuse into your bloodstream, and you know what it's going to do? It's going to alter your thinking. It's gonna, that's why the Bible says be sober-minded. It's not talking about just not drinking alcohol, yes, but it's saying spiritually be sober-minded, because just as a man that is drunk with wine, cannot see right? Come on, somebody. Amen. Hey, y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking to a bunch of naive people, right? Just as a man that has had too much to drink can't see right, he doesn't hear what he's supposed to hear, and he does not know which direction he's supposed to be going. A man that's not spiritually sober cannot see the signs of the times, cannot does not know the direction in which he's supposed to go. The Lord wants us filled with the Spirit, not spirit. Spirits, if you will, right? John chapter 2, verse 6. This is the first miracle that Jesus ever performed. I can tell you right now, Jesus' plan was not to get people drunk. I can tell you right now that whenever you look at what happened in here, there was six water pots is what the Bible says. Six. Did they look like this? I don't know, but I thought it was a cool picture. Six water pots made of stone coming from the earth that were for Jewish Purification, ritualistic purification. So what would they do? They would use the water that was in there to clean and to wash themselves. But listen, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant could only clean the outside. But what Jesus did was he performed an internal miracle. I want you to see that. He changed the inner the material that was on the inside of the vessel itself. He turned it from dirty old water into wine. And wine that was better than the stuff that they were serving the first time. Because see, the new covenant is so much better than the old covenant because it's a fulfillment. What is it about the new covenant that I'm so concerned for this gentleman and really the people that would sit under him to miss this big point? What's such a big deal about the new covenant that we wouldn't want to miss? Because in the old covenant, the Spirit of God was with his people, but in the new covenant, the Spirit of God is in his people. And listen, if the Spirit of God be in you, if God be for you, who can be against you? That's the word of the Lord right there. You need to believe that. You need to be able to walk in that truth. Amen. So I want you to see six. I talk about that a lot of times. I want you to remember that. That's an important number. Six is the number of man. That's why in the book of Revelation, whenever we talk about the beast in Revelation 13, it's six, six, six. It's the number of man. It's the fulfillment of man. Mankind rises above God. The enemy uses man to try to combat to rebel against God. Man was created on the sixth day. I don't think that this is accidental. You see, I serve a God that writes at so many different layers that no matter how deep you dig, you're going to come up with the same story. It's a story of hope. It's a story of redemption. It's a story where he changes the inside of the vessel. He turned that stone that came from the earth that were pots of purification that only provided external cleansing, he changed the inner contents of that vessel. That is a type of the new covenant like I've never seen before. It's the very first miracle that Jesus performed. He's not just trying to give people wine to drink. My friend, don't let anybody ever lie to you about that. There's a much bigger picture here, and it's so important. And those people that are saying that, they need to hear the, they need to hear the hope of the truth, amen, because they're searching for something, and what they're looking for is we want to fix what they need, amen. 
Now this brings us into this passage of scripture here about God commanding the light to shine. This is 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I mean, if you just think about what Paul is saying right there, you know, he's talking about creation first, right? He said, God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. So he's connecting the creation story when God said, let there be light, amen, and there was light. He's connecting the creation story to the miracle that happens to you and I whenever we get saved. He says, and Paul's speaking specifically of himself, and he says, the God that commanded light to shine out of darkness has shined on the inside of our hearts. He allowed the light of God to come on the inside of our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, God reveals himself through the person of Jesus. The word of God, he is Jesus. And the word that we read is the word of Jesus. It's the whole word, the whole plan was Jesus from the beginning. Before man ever fell, God's plan was to give us Jesus. Amen. And, and look what it says. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. I want you to see that clay pot right now. That clay pot formed out of the ground and breathed life into the lungs and the nostrils of Adam and made him a living soul. But then... The fall of man that caused that clay to become marred. You know, there's actually a scripture <laughs> that talks about that. Uh, Jeremiah 18. I was thinking about it last night. I love the prophets. and The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in chapter 18. And the Lord told Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house. Go down to the potter's house and there I will speak to you, my Lord. And Jeremiah said, I went down to the potter's house, and he said, I saw upon the wheel marred clay. Have you ever seen, you know, have you ever watched like sometimes a video or in some movie or whatever the case where they got the clay spinning on the wheel and the potter's over there and he's, he, he's shaping it. Isn't that cool whenever you can see somebody has that skill to do that and they can make it do all kinds of stuff flare up. And then all of a sudden, it, the the least little thing, I don't know if it's the wheel gets a little wobble or if they hit it the wrong way and it's like it starts spinning askew and just like gets all twisted up and all over on the side. And so when Jeremiah went to the potter's house, he said that that's what he saw. He saw that the clay was marred. I gotta tell you that God created mankind out of the dust or the clay of the earth. He breathed his life giving breath into him, but the fall of man caused the clay of God to become marred. It's all, it's distorted in the eyes of God. But God told Jeremiah, and see, God's always got a word of hope. Sometimes you might feel like your life looks more. Sometimes you might feel like your children's life looks more. I mean, Lord help us. Amen? Sometimes things look like they're spinning askew in our lives or in the people that we love. But can I tell you that God holds it in his hand. He is the potter. Amen? And he knows that. And he tells them. He says, hey, Jeremiah, tell Israel that they are like the clay in the potter's hand. That they have become more. That they are thrown off the lake of this potter. He's gonna, you know what he's going to do? He's just going to start all over again, my friend. He's going to start all over again. He's going to start to shape. And he will be successful in the production of a vessel. And he said, listen, I can make you a new. God has a good word for you and I this morning to let us know that he gives hope to us. And that we have this treasure in this earthen vessel within this marred clay that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now I want to encourage you with something this morning. Because this happens to every believer. It's happened to me so many times. And I guarantee you it's happened to you already. And it will likely happen to you again. That in your journey of Christianity, you're going to do something that you wish you would have done. I'm telling you right now it's going to happen. Because guess what, my friend? You ain't perfect. You serve the one that was. You serve the one that is. But... He ain't you. He's in you. And he will continue to lead you and guide you. And he will continue to give you strength. 
But I guarantee you, your connection to this earth is going to manifest itself. Sometimes you don't even see it. Because sometimes the fall is so deep on the inside of us, and it's not even obvious things like it used to be. You understand what I'm trying to say? See, back whenever I was doing drugs and quit a high school dropout and like completely living for the flesh, the whole time I knew I was wrong. I'm telling you right now, my sister told me about Jesus when I was 13, and I never forgot it. I had gone up to the altar on more than one occasion. God had been part of my life, but I just pushed it in the back of my mind, and I just forged forward, and I continued to do. Listen, there was no confusion with that. Yeah. But then after I became saved and started to want to live for the Lord, I didn't realize the depth of the things that were on the inside of me. I hope that doesn't make you feel weird. I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I'm just trying to encourage you to let you know that you're a work in progress. Amen. I was sharing with Elijah the other day up there. I said, hey, Elijah, you being a good boy? He's like, I already got that. <laughs> I said, hold on, Elijah. You know, he is a good boy. But I, I said, hold on, Elijah. Don't you remember the song? <laughs> He's still working on me. To make me what I ought to be. I said, Elijah, it only took him one day to make the moon and the stars and Jupiter and Mars. But he's still working on me. Amen. And he's still working on you. And he's working on all of us. But sometimes we don't even realize how much we need him to work on it. Because there's something connected to this earth that also in our flesh thinks more of ourselves than what we ought to. Is that not true? The word of God warns us. Don't think more highly of yourself than what you ought. You know, we started, I mean, I told y'all my story before, but you got your own story, so you can put in your own blanks. How I can remember thinking when I was in church after the Lord got a hold of me and, and some of that stuff, the pornography was being broken off and other things were being broken off. But then the next thing, you know, I'm inside, inside of a church service and I'm like, hmm, they only raise one hand, and when I worship the Lord, I raise two. And sometimes I go up to the front and I get on my knees, and I even shed a tear or two. You know, I wasn't really saying anything exactly like that. I was really puffed up in my heart. Now, the Lord had to show me in the midst of all of that. And that, thank God, at that time, I was pretty soft to the Lord, and he was there. He was like, look at you. Look what happened you arrived. Look at you. You, know, you, were just, you know, my mom always had a little plaque in the, in the house, and this is a true story. It said, Matthew. God's gift. <laughs> well, that was a good little plaque, Mama. Thank you. And guess what? Jesus is God's Amen. gift. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. So, and that's part of it. See, I hope you can read it. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels at the bottom there that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That's part of the reason that God uh, uh, works in more clay. Amen? That's part of the reason why God does a work on the inside of our hearts and our lives. Don't let the enemy beat you down with the fact that sometimes you're still a mess. And that sometimes you realize that the thoughts in your mind or the way that you feel in your heart isn't right. It, it, you know, the Lord wants you to wants to reveal that to you so that you'll call out to Him and say, Lord, please do a work on the inside. Don't ever quit crying out to God to do a work on the inside of your heart. Don't ever quit crying out to God to fill you up with His Spirit. Amen. God wants to reveal those things to you and He wants you to go to Him and to learn how to be dependent on Him. But what the enemy wants to do is He wants to magnify the things that are in your heart. He wants, to, he wants to magnify the things that are in your mind, the way that you think. He wants, to, he wants to make you be puffed up. He wants to make you be prideful. Don't let the end, and then, and then, and then whenever something doesn't go right, he wants to beat you down. He wants to condemn you. Don't let the enemy condemn you. Jesus paid a high price so that you could be filled with his glory. And see, God knows how to bring glory to himself. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God knows how to allow others to see, know that he is real. Oh, the whole world around you will try to beat you down. They'll laugh at you. Oh, you're such a Christian. Some of the people that you love the most will say those kinds yeah. of things to you. Oh, you're just such a Christian. Look at you. Look how you act. They're just waiting for you to mess up. But guess what? You don't stress over that. And you bring it to the Lord. Amen. 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 You have a mediator. There's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. And listen, Jesus. you belong to the Lord. He bought Amen. you with his blood. Amen. Amen. And I'm yes. telling you right now, he's waiting. He's on the edge of his seat. Just waiting to hear that whisper for you to call on his name. Amen. And I'm telling you, he'll minister to you. Amen. Amen. 
So here we got 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7, the earthen vessel. Amen. He puts the treasure of his presence in us, an earthen vessel. That way he gets the glory. Amen. The picture of this broken vessel brings me back to our original story. You remember the story with the pitchers and the flames on the inside? Judges 7, 16. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and they put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch and they had but newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and they broke the pitchers that were in their hand. I want you to think about that. Now it's a, again, it's a clay pot. That's how they made vessels back then. It's clay. It came from the earth. Just like Adam came from the earth. Just like you came from Adam and you're of this earth. But there was a light hidden on the inside of this earthen vessel. And it was when that pot was broken that the light was revealed. Now, I can only imagine, speaking in war time, what that must have looked like, again, if you were in the bottom of a valley and you're in camp. And again, I'll tell you how many people there were and all their tents are set up and all the lights of the campfire are going. And then they're somehow able to hide this light on the inside of this picture and then they all break it at one time, and they've got a hundred over here on the right, a hundred right here in front of them, a hundred on the left side, and all this light begins to shine up on the mountaintop. And the Bible says that the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his God. I want you to see that. Like, the title of my message again was, Let the Light of the Lord Blind Your Enemy. Let me say that again. Let the light of the Lord blind your enemy. You know, the enemy of your soul, he wants to come against you. He's constantly set in a trap. The New Testament says that we have to be protected from the wiles of Satan. When I see that word wiles in the old King James, it makes me think of wily coyote. It makes me think of the road runner and how the road, the coyote was always set to trap. The road. He's always trying to, he's got wily, wiles and trickery. He's always trying to set a trap. But let me tell you something, there's a place in Christ. There's a place of victory with the Lord. Yeah, where when the light of the Lord shows up in your heart and in your life and shines through that marred clay. I'm telling you right now, the Lord brings confusion into the camp of the enemy. The very, as soon as, just as soon as the enemy thinks that he set the trap for you, he's about, I'm not a fisherman, but I know I, I've, I've been, I've thrown enough lines in the water to know you can feel whenever that fish is nibbling on the bait. And there's a right time whenever you're supposed to ah, set the hook. And as soon as the enemy thinks he's about to set it, how many times has God shown up just in the nick of time, just at the last moment when you needed him the most, when it looked like all was about to fail, the Lord show up and he'll do the work. Listen, God will turn his light into the enemy's camp and he will begin to cause confusion into the enemy's camp where the enemy turns his own swords upon, him, upon themselves, killing his fellow comrade. And God is in the battle for you and I. And listen, whenever God shows up in the battle, my friends, Amen. we have everything we call yes. and more. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. I just want to kind of, I'm getting ready to close with some of this right here, that 1 Corinthians 15, 47, the, the, the context of this chapter really has to do with the resurrection, also known as the rapture of the church, okay? And the fact that we're going to receive a glorified body one day, amen? Isn't that good news? I don't know about yes. you, but... I, I try hard to stay halfway fit or whatever. This old body, man, it just gets tired. And it doesn't want to let me do what I want to do. And, and, we're, and everything, like the King James would say, is waxing old. It's just getting older, right? And we see death dying and decay. But listen, look what it says. The first man is of the earth. It's earthy. <laughs> I like that. I kept looking at a bunch of different translations, but I was like, you know, look, it doesn't get any better than that. It's of the earth and it's earthy. In other words, it's still got this connection to this earth, this fallen world. And listen, until we, till gravity loses its hold and we see our Lord, the Bible says that when we see him, we will become yes. We're not going to become a God. This is an organism. I was talking to a guy 
<laughs> the other day. Well, anyway, raising Mormonism. I'm learning how to do not be condescending to people. Praise God. Amen. You know what I'm saying? This guy was raised in that. He doesn't know that. You know? He came and now he's going to ask me some questions. You know? Uh, but, but guess what? You're not going to be a God. You're not going to have your own plan. <coughs> this is at four. You're <laughs> not a demigod. You're going to be like Christ in that you're going to have a glorified body like the man Christ Jesus who came in his sinless flesh and died for you and I in his resurrection from the dead. He received a glorified body. And I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but you're going to be able to walk through walls, my friend. And the life is not going to be the blood anymore. It's going to be the spirit. And you're still going to be able to eat and drink. I don't know how it's all going to work, but I believe it. Listen to me. Let, listen. How, well, how can you say such a thing? This doesn't have anything to do with my message, but I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. There's some things going on in this world that are way above my pay grade. Like, for instance, when I was in elementary chemistry, and they wanted me to memorize how many electrons or whatever was on each type of element or atom. And they tell me that animate objects on the earth, you know, listen to me, are in motion. Did you not learn that? Yeah. You were supposed to have learned that. I didn't even pay attention in school. <laughs> and I remember learning that. Everything that you see in this room is in motion. That is not according to the word of God. And that is not, yes, I can find scripture to back it up. That's according to the scientists that we are learning from. That everything in this room is in motion. It's all made up of atoms. You're sitting in a chair that's moving. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews and also in Colossians that he upholds all things by the word of his mouth. What I'm trying to tell you is if the Lord quits speaking, then atoms no longer are coalesced and moving in their proper direction. And everything begins to implode, explode. Everything begins to fall apart. Now that's the God I serve. I believe that with all of my heart. I, I don't care how smart the doctor is, how smart the scientist is, they will never convince me based upon the things that God has done in my heart, based upon the things that I've seen in His Word, that they're right and this is wrong. No sir, no ma'am, they're not going to convince me. What I'm trying to tell you is that somehow, someway, the God that created this universe by speaking His Word and all of these atoms came together and formed what it is that we see now, one day He's going to change this this old corrupted body. He's going to give it a new body and somehow these atoms that are moving are no longer going to prevent me from going wherever Amen. I need to go. Yes. I don't understand at all but I'm here to tell you. The Bible says Jesus looked like that and at the same time he told that he told Thomas he said go ahead. Thrust your finger into my side. Spirit does not have flesh and bone. He didn't say blood. He wasn't dripping blood all over the place but he still had a, he still had a gash in his side. He said, you stick your finger in these hands right here. You're not over there dropping blood all over the place. That's why I'm trying to tell you that it's going to be the spirit of God that gives life yes. to the glorified body. Amen. 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 But walls didn't contain it. Anyway, that was another. You're not going to be, listen, you might be of the earth and earthy today a little bit. You're supposed to be a little less earthy today than you were yesterday, though. Amen. Come on, Christian. But guess what? There's going to be a day when you ain't going to be so hurt no more. Yes. You're going to be like the Lord, amen. You're going to be like the, the last Adam, like the second Adam, amen. You're going to be, you're going to be the Lord, you're going to be from the Lord of heaven, amen. Part of him. We're a part of him right now. I want you to know that. I still can't get that out of my head about, about that old boy's position, you know? About not being in the new covenant because this is for another time, but I can't help myself. And he bases it all off of Jeremiah 31. About when God promised a new covenant to the house of Israel. And he said that the, the, the new covenant hasn't come to Israel yet. Yeah, but they offered it. He offered it to them. Yeah. He offered it to them. Amen. Go to the house of Israel first. But they rejected. But hallelujah, God's not done with them. Then this new covenant is going to find a place of fulfillment. But guess what? The new covenant, the kingdom of God, is resident on the inside of you. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have this treasure in earthen vessels that the glory of God, that he might get the glory, hallelujah, and that it not be of us. So right now we might be of the earth, we might be a little bit earthy, but hallelujah, the Bible also says that you're a partaker of the divine nature. That's what it says in the letter that Peter wrote. 
You're a partaker of the divine nature. Amen. When you got saved, this presence of God came to live on the inside of you, and you are a partaker of the divine Amen. nature. But look, see this man of the earth, this earthy man? If he refuses to walk after the spirit and instead walks after the flesh, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. I'm just curious, like back there in the back, can y'all can y'all read that thing on the right or not really? You can You can read? Good. It's hard to read. Might be kind of hard, but if they can read, you should be able to read it. No. How does the flesh get in the way and prevent God from getting his glory? See, the flesh wants some stuff. See, what I want you to know, I don't want this to be a mysterious message. I really want it to be real clear. I'm trying to tell you that that clay pot over that torch hid the light. I'm trying to tell you that God created man from the earth and formed him from the clay of the earth and the clay of the earth and the clay of those pots and the stone of those water purifications and this earthen vessel all describe the fact that you and I are made of clay and that we're a vessel formed by the master's hand but that once we get saved the light of God is now on the inside of us and that light wants to come out and reveal itself to a lost and a dying world. But the flesh wants See, that clay pot doesn't really want to be broken. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever not noticed how hard we'll fight against the Lord to be broken sometimes? In our own mindsets, you know. Well, you know, preacher, I mean, I've come a long way, bless God. You know, I don't smoke anymore and I don't do that. Well, praise God, I thank God you ain't filling your lungs with cigarette smoke no more. You're filling your lip with dip or whatever you used to do. Praise God. What about mindsets? Amen. You know? Whatever they may be, that are contrary to the word of the Lord. I don't have time to sit here and start trying to list them all off. But let's just look at a couple of things. First off, the flesh wants pleasure over God. You, you, you know what I'm saying? The flesh wants pleasure over God. If it feels good, if it smells good, if it tastes good, and you know, I just, I just, want, I just want it. Now, it's not always bad. But if it's pleasure over God, that's a problem. So I just want you to understand that this earthy man... That, that that clay shell, that marred clay, that thing that comes from the earth that's earthy, it try, it's wanting pleasure over God. That's a problem, Christian. Yeah. Amen? Whatever the pleasure may be. Sometimes it even seems like it would be good stuff. Right? That, that, and, 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 and that's another thing. It wants its own glory. The flesh wants its own glory. I want you to know that. Don't think that it doesn't, because it does. The flesh wants, oh, well, that, I mean, I'm just trying to use an example. Because, I mean, let me tell you why. I'm not saying that you think that way at this church. I'm telling you what I saw when I was at other churches. Well, that preacher don't even appreciate me. He don't, he don't even use me. You know, well, sometimes, listen, you know, if you feel like you got a gift to use, come, come talk to the preacher, you know? I, I mean, the crazy thing is, is that when I was thinking that, is that, I was actually being used. <laughs> I just wasn't being as used as much as I thought I was. But, but, you know what's so beautiful about God is that when we start to partner with Him, now again, this is not my message, but I've shared this with you on multiple occasions. There's a word that keeps showing up in the Greek New Testament that I've been seeing. And the word is koinonia. It's spelled K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. Koinonia. It's, it's translated oftentimes as fellowship. But also it's translated sometimes as communion. Okay. And that word literally in, the, in the, the definition of it is joint participation. So the idea is, is that when we come together as, a, as the body of Christ and we take communion together, we're jointly participating with one another in our worship of the Lord, in our remembrance of how Jesus died on the cross for us. Right? So there's a joint participation. There's also scriptures that use koinonia in the Greek New Testament that describe you and I joint participating with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> what does that mean? Instead of us hindering his work in our lives, we start to help him in his work in our lives. Meaning that we start to surrender to what he's showing us instead of us 
being like this earthy man that fights against what God is trying to do. See, nobody knows we in the scripture last week whenever I whenever I preached, it said, No man knows the spirit of a man save that man's spirit. Meaning you don't know nobody knows you like you know yourself. No man knows God like the Spirit of God. And then he went on to say, for we have not received the spirit of the world, but we have received the spirit of God. So what he's saying is that you and I ought to understand the things of God because we've got the spirit of God. Amen. And, but, what he said, but, he, but what he also said in there, and that wasn't his emphasis, but what he also said in there is no man knows you like you know yourself. I mean, God knows you better than you know yourself. But, you know, Aaron, might, Aaron knows me. He knows me better than most of y'all, but he don't know me like I know me. Right? And, and many times what I'm trying to say is, is that the Lord's contending with each and every one of us. His spirit on the inside is speaking to us. He's telling us little things and snippets about our personality, about the way that we act, about the way that we treat people, about the places that we fall short of the glory of God. That, that's a good thing, Christian. Yes. And when the spirit of God is speaking to us and contending with us, that's a good thing. That means... That he's communicating with us and he's revealing to us the areas of our life that he wants to be broken. He wants the flesh, he wants the clay pot to be broken so that this earthen vessel can shine forth the glory of God so that he can be revealed on the earth so that people can see the good news of God so that they can for themselves can taste and see the God. Amen. Judges 7-2, the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved. Musicians and singers, y'all can come up, we're about to close with a song of worship. That's kind of like sums up the whole story right here. We didn't read the whole story, but I told you earlier that you know, the scene starts with 22,000 warriors, and God says, you got too many people. You got too many people for me to give you the victory. Because, see, if I give you the victory right now, Israel is going to boast and say, I saved my own, my own hand. Saved me. And, you know, this is just one example. I use myself as an example because I'm the one that's standing here right now. But if I handed each one of you the mic, you could tell us something. That, and I've told you this before, that sometimes when I start to share my testimony with people, and if, listen, if you start sharing your testimony with people out in public, you really don't need the microphone to tell, uh, I mean, listen, we want you to share your testimony, but what you really need to share your testimony with the world. And, and, and one of the things that, I, that I've learned is, is that when I, sometimes when I start to say my testimony about how I was a high school dropout, about I was all messed up, because I'll tell nurses this, I'll tell the doctors this, because I've been the board over this before, right? And it's, and it's God that's done me, giving me the grace and the strength that I need in order to share my testimony. I don't really care what you do. I know what God has done. Let God be true in every man. But it never fails because there's people out there that don't really understand the things of God. Y'all know what I'm talking about. If y'all start sharing your testimony more, you'll start to realize that there's people out there that don't understand. And if you had a mess of a life in the past and God has cleaned you up, they, they always say to me, but look, what, look what you did for yourself. And I always have to stop them. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I know I even said this to y'all last week, but I can't stop saying it. You don't understand. It wasn't me. I know what Matt can do, and I can, I know what, what Matt, God can do through that, but it wasn't me, and, and guess what? If I wasn't as messed up as what I was, I might have thought in my mind that, look what I've done. Amen. The Lord said, no, you got too many people, we're going to whittle you down to 300, and you're going to take on the many. And I said, I'm going to turn their sword on them, and I'm going to give you the because I ain't nobody getting his glory except for me because the glory belongs to the Lord. That's why he uses earthen vessels. That's why he uses more clay. Let us let him break our flesh so that his light can shine through. Amen. Just worship the Lord as we leave. If you need prayer, amen. The altar is open.